Good evening. Tonight's story is a journey of the senses, an odyssey around the globe from the comfort of your warm, cosy bed. Tonight, we travel across time and space, from the golden glory of China's Shang Dynasty to the elegant halls of Victorian England, from the tropical forests of pre-colonial America to the snowy cities of present-day Russia. We will visit Indian tea harvesters, take counsel from a wise elephant, and take part in a sacred tea ceremony. We'll brew creamy Earl Grey in sitting rooms of chintz and oak, rest in flowery tea groves among the peaks of mountainous China, and sip chilled yerba mate with indigenous harvesters in Paraguay. We will brew smoky Russian teas with a friendly ballerina, accept the blessings of a Paraguayan tea goddess, and witness the gift of a single seed, planted, nourished, and loved by generations over. Tonight, we share the story of tea as we embark on a thousand-year voyage joining the celebrated tea leaf as it travels the world countless times over. So snuggle up under your blankets and prepare for a wonderful night of sleep. And once you're all settled in, close your eyes. We begin in ancient China. Imagine, if you will, your comfortable bed with you in it, sitting atop a raised sandstone plateau, surrounded by rows upon rows of luscious tea plants. It is late afternoon, the sun's golden rays fading with every passing minute, and the air is humid with the promise of rain. In the distance, lush forests of jinko, lychee and ginseng give way to faraway mountain peaks, a rugged silhouette against a thick blanket of clouds. You are safe here, tucked into crisp sheets of clean cotton, your fluffy blanket gathered all around you. At your bedside, a clay pot and cup perch on a woven bamboo stool, the pot steaming with warmth. If you inhale, slowly, peacefully, you might catch the scent of hand-rolled tea pearls, a floral jasmine. Inhale once more, and you may be lucky enough to scent the tea trees among these tumbling hills, earthy and ripe for harvest. These groves hold sacred pu'er trees, ancient and revered. They have thrived for centuries here, perhaps millennia, China is the birthplace of tea. Many moons ago, air and earth converged as one ethereal energy to gift humans with tea, the froth of the liquid jade, or so the legends say. It happened on a humid day in late summer, the world still but for a single curious breeze. The breeze had played among the leaves of an ancient pu'er tree for centuries, and as it played, it asked the tree to share its medicines with the people, promising that it would carry the gift to humankind. The tree readily agreed. The breeze carried dried tea leaves for many miles and many days, dancing across plains and forests and mountains. It is said that a wise emperor, loved and revered by his people, enjoyed a pot of hot water on his veranda at every sunrise. The breeze blew the ancient tree's leaves into the waiting water, and as they infused the water with humanity's first taste of tea, 
the earth sighed. And so it was. The people of China gladly embraced tea and what it represented, the elixir of life. Over time, villages and towns rose among China's mountainous regions, families flourishing alongside a profusion of teas. Young sensha, light and aromatic. Rich longjin, spiced and spirited. Ancient pu'er, seemingly immortal, a friend of the people. Processing methods were passed down from generation to generation, each family preferring slightly different approaches. Villages of the east pan-fried crushed longjin leaves, not once, but twice, the drink itself eventually becoming known as Dragonwell tea. Southern villages smoked raw lapsang leaves over pine wood fires, the tea tasting of thick wood smoke and sweet pine sap. Pu'er tea leaves were consumed raw or fermented over time. Both practices considered divine and godly under the caring presence of the sacred tree. Today, tea remains the beating heart of China's mythology, culture and philosophy. Buddhism declares tea a universal connector, linking one's inner spirit and mind in meditation. Taoism believes that tea helps drinkers exist in harmony with the elements of air and water, earth and fire. Tea bids us to sit a spell, speak with loved ones, and enjoy a steaming hot drink as we rest our tired feet. It asks us to pause, close our eyes, and listen to the pitter-patter of raindrops as we warm our hands and our hearts over a steaming, steeping pot of goodness. Most of all, it tells us to pause our busy lives Take a long, slow breath and find peace within ourselves. And now it is time for that very thing. Pause, breathe and look inwards. Your tea is ready and around you the world is still and silent. There is no breeze, no rain, no movement, nothing but you and a cup of tea suspended in time. When you are ready, take a sip, the first of three. Warmth will flood your body, flushing your fingers and toes. Your tongue will pucker at the distinct dryness of jasmine tannins, a hint of oolong and oak lingering at the back of your throat. Your second sip will taste of delicate white peonies and nutty almonds, warming the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. Your third and last sip reminds you of syrupy plums, a husky sweetness that will last long after the clay pot is empty. When you are ready, snuggle deeper under your blanket. Nestle further into your pillows. We must continue our travels. We saw east. You and your bed glide over the yellow sea, the ocean of sparkling stars above you mirrored in the calm waters below. You cross small golden islands scattered below you, their beaches warm and inviting. The trip is not a long one. We journey to the lands of delicate origami art and intricate silk kimonos, of sea-bound Buddhist temples and sacred Mount Fuji, of pink sakura blossoms and lavender plum blossoms. We travel to Japan. 
your bed comes to rest in a beautiful Japanese garden. You are sheltered under the loving branches of blooming cherry trees, their buds falling onto your blanket like blushing snowflakes. A clay cup waits on a small pine table next to you. There is a pond in front of you, lily pads drifting on the surface of the water. Beyond that, you see a cosy tea house open to the garden. It has sliding doors of pine and paper, soft floors of rice straw, and a sloped roof made of fragrant cypress. Inside, you see a stone basin filled with cool water. A tray sits next to the basin with carefully assembled tea utensils. This is a shashitsu, a tea house that Buddhist monks built for one purpose, the way of tea, a sacred ceremony meant to honor humanity's spiritual connection with nature. Long ago, Zen Buddhists carried sencha seeds from China's mountainous regions to Kyoto, encasing their precious cargo in protective silks. They had learned from China's customs, believing that tea had the ability to make one's life spiritually complete. It is said that the monks planted the seeds under the shade of a Sakura tree, declaring that the tree's shared energy would help the plants thrive. As the first sensha sprouted, monks meditated around the plant, finding Zen at the core of their being. From then on, sensha grown in shade was known as dual dew. A woman enters the shashitsu. She wears a silk kimono of robin's egg blue. Her black hair is looped through a pair of bamboo chopsticks. Kneeling on a pillow, she dips her fingers into the stone basin, cleansing her hands, arms and face. Ritual purification is important before the ceremony begins. The woman dips each utensil into the purifying basin, the clay tea bowl for carrying hot water, the obsidian tea scoop for doling out matcha powder, the cypress whisk to mix the two elements in harmony. When each item is cleansed, she settles them onto the bamboo tray once more, their placement exact. Over time, the way of tea became a sacred ritual practiced across Japan. The ceremony was a symbol of cultural refinement, representing healthy faith, artistic expertise, and devotion to one's community. Japanese people believed that there was a certain tranquility in ceremony preparation, in the movement from one point to another. Arranging pillows for guests, boiling water, pouring matcha powder into clay cups. Today, the ceremony is considered one of three classical Japanese arts of refinement. Firstly, flower arrangement. Secondly, incense appreciation. Thirdly, and most importantly, preparing for the way of tea. With her preparation complete, the woman heaps two dollops of matcha powder into her cup. She pours hot water next, whisking the tea as she goes. As her cup fills, so does yours. The woman faces you and bows, palms clasped together at her chest. She has readied the way of tea, and this ceremony is for you and you only. For the second time, pause, breathe, and look inwards. At home in this beautiful Japanese garden, please take pleasure 
in this sweet moment of peace. Your matcha tea is the platonic ideal of delicacy. It's beauty in its ephemeral nature. Flavors last only for an instant, gone so quickly you wonder if you imagine them. But each sip revisits the same plentitude of tastes, hovering on a new and unknown flavor there under the sakura blossoms. On your first sip, you taste elderflower, fragile and fleeting. On your second sip, you taste umami, all the flavor suspended in your cup. On your third and last sip, the frothy drink seems to be the very personification of nature itself, fresh, green and bountiful. Once ready, we continue on our journey. You are safe and warm in your cozy bed and the world calls. Our third stop bids us to travel southwest. Soaring over southern China once more, you see rows upon rows of tea plantations below, poor trees standing watch for eternity. We fly across Myanmar and the Bay of Bengal. The sapphire water looks smooth and glassy from the safe vantage point of your cozy bed. We travel to the land of the Taj Mahal and the Ganges River, to colorful festivals and hot spices, to henna tattoos and dusty cricket games. We fly to India. Your bed takes its descent on the outskirts of present-day Darjeeling, a thriving city tucked into the lower hills of the Himalayas. It is here that the champagne of teas is grown, harvested and processed, the only locale in the world to claim the distinctive black tea as its own. Aficionados have held the tea in high esteem for years, crowning praise over Darjeeling's unique flavor. It is said that the region is a microcosm of its own, providing tea plants with a perfect terroir in which to prosper. We land on a small outcropping of rocks tucked into the side of a mountain. Behind your bed, an elderly man sits on a stool in front of his wooden home, singing under his breath. This man is a tea harvester and an orchid gardener, and he is in need of a moment to rest. It is the second flush before monsoon season, the quarterly harvest in which Darjeeling is at its ripest. The man has been picking leaves since dawn. The man has lived in this home on the mountain for as long as he can remember. Indian tea culture began centuries ago, and his family has lived in this home for generations. It was his ancestor who helped a British count smuggle tea seeds out of China, planting them in these very hills. Years ago, the man built the rock wall in front of you, planting a garden of rare orchids just outside his front door. This place overlooks the sprawling city of Darjeeling, but here he finds peace. In the distance you can see the seemingly never-ending Himalayas, their peaks disappearing in the clouds above. The man stops singing and clears his throat. As you took in the city's landscape, he perched a cup of steaming hot tea on the rock wall steam whirls disappearing into the sky. Every harvest, the man pockets a handful of leaves, just enough for a cup or two of perfect Darjeeling. This cup is a gift for you. The man sits back on his stool, singing again. 
His voice is lovely, melodious and smooth. He sings of the green earth and the blue sea, the golden sun and fresh morning air. As he sings, the moment comes. For the third time, pause, take a breath and look inwards. While the city of Darjeeling bustles below, enjoy the stillness offered to you in this delicious cup of tea. On your first sip, the tea tastes like green grapes, ripe apricot, and rich guava. You imagine dried raisins, fresh hay, and even pineapple. Darjeeling has a distinct sweetness, a musky spiciness reminiscent of turmeric and cinnamon. On your second sip, the tea seems to grow smokier and you imagine a cozy wood stove, an oak fire burning merrily in the man's home behind you. This assortment of flavours is called muscatel, exclusive to Darjeeling tea and without an equal, or so the experts say. On your third sip, you sense molasses and honey, deep caramel and rich cinnamon. It is said that Darjeeling tea is drunk by gods and you can believe it. The man rises from his stool stretching. It is time for him to continue picking leaves, but not before a friendly goodbye. In one swift movement, he plucks an orchid from his garden and gives it to you, smiling broadly. You accept with gratitude. It will be a keepsake on the next part of your journey. We rise. You and your bed glide over the golden deserts of the Middle East, the waters of the Caspian and Black Seas far below, and twinkling planets high above. We travel to a land closely bound to India, borrowing its rich tea traditions and spices over the centuries. We are bound for the land of misty moors and lush green fields of afternoon tea and time-honoured traditions, of aristocracy and monarchy. We are bound for Great Britain. Imagine horse-drawn carriages rolling down narrow cobbled streets, Big Ben towering high above. Children play hopscotch and skip under the watchful eyes of mothers in aprons and fathers smoking cigars, and the air smells of newly gathered hay and rich oil, of freshly baked bread and scones. It is late afternoon in Victorian England, and across London, upper and middle class households bustle with the preparation of the traditional afternoon tea. You are settled in your comfortable bed in the corner of a cavernous sitting room, the walls lined with hundreds of books. A fire crackles in a large fireplace to your left, warming your toes. To your right, a porcelain teacup awaits. The room is filled with rosewood chesterfields and armchairs ebony tables and china cabinets, and cushions outfitted in hunter's green and rich burgundy. Balcony windows line the far wall, sun rays warming the lush carpets. English roses grow in the garden just outside, buds spanning from rich crimson to elegant blush and pure white. 
you feel a light breeze on your face and notice that one window is propped open, swaying slightly in the wind. Scents float up to your nostrils, the heavenly smell of roses, elderflower, pears, and a sweetness you can only equate to the warmth of the sun. A creature shifts below you, stretching in a pool of sunlight on the carpet. You look down. A Persian cat has been basking in the sunlight. She stretches, rolls over once, and begins to lick her paws, keeping an amber eye on you. She wears a small bow around her neck. As she washes, the cat begins to purr. Here, among the books and flowers, you are toasty and safe. Today, we hold the distinct pleasure of taking afternoon tea in the London manor of the esteemed Duchess of Bedford, the veritable creator of Britain's afternoon tea. If we are to believe the story, the Duchess grew peckish before dinner one day, and so she asked her maid to prepare a sip and a nibble just before dusk. Her maid served a cup of sweet Darjeeling and a small cucumber sandwich. The Duchess was best of friends with Queen Victoria, and once the monarch began to nibble on biscuits, the rest was history. British aristocrats took on the custom in droves, swiftly followed by the middle and working classes. Among the landed gentry, afternoon tea was the height of sophistication. Among others, it was a welcome lull to sit for a moment, enjoy a piping hot drink, and rest with family. The Persian cat meows. She hops onto the wide mantelpiece above the fireplace, rubbing the edge with her cheek. Here, the Duchess has arranged a lavish collection of tinned teas, metal boxes cued one by one in a decadent gesture of welcome. Among the tins are creamy old greys with notes of malt and caramel, citrusy orange picots that will taste of early spring blossoms, musky Darjeeling with hints of sugarcane and molasses, Tucked among the black teas are rich chai teas spiced with cinnamon, ginger and turmeric. Not to mention mouth-watering herbal tisan with pink rose petals, white chrysanthemums and a dash of lavender. There are imported jasmine pearls, hand-crushed golden peony tea, and a box with a label that you can't quite see. It smells of wet earth and silky cocoa. The cat weaves among the tins, sniffing some, moving past others. She pauses at an Earl Grey, batting it with a paw. The choice is clear. As your cup steeps with the paw-picked black tea, your mind wanders. Perhaps no other country has based its cultural and social identity on tea as much as England. Long ago, the drink was considered medicinal, able to cure ailments and illnesses, and as its popularity grew, so too did its power to heal. History tells us that boiling water saved the British time and time again, and across the country, good health soared. It soon became quite normal to share tea accoutrements among friends, family, and communities. A simple cup of tea, milk, and honey brought people together. No matter how busy their days were, the British always set aside tea time for a moment of peace. While your imagination wandered, the Duchess's household quietly served you a three-tiered platter, heaping with fare. 
cucumber and parsley sandwiches, cheese scones with fresh rosemary, date studded biscuits with clotted cream, and lemon cakes drizzled with honey. There is even a small chocolate tucked among the desserts, rare in such a time. Purring with pleasure, the Persian cat brushes your hand for a thorough cheek scratch. Your Earl Grey is steeped to perfection, steam rising from the porcelain teacup. You find cream and sugar in a saucer next to your platter. Happily nibbling on a sandwich, you add cream and sugar, stirring your tea until it reaches a deep caramel color. Your tea is ready. For the fourth time, pause, breathe, and look inwards. The sitting room has frozen in time. Dust motes hang in the sunlight, glittering like starry constellations. Take a deep breath. When you are ready, your tea awaits. Your first sip tastes of cherries and pine twigs, a certain woody aftertaste that lingers just behind your teeth. The tea has warmed you, yes, but this is a different kind of heat than jasmine tea. This is a slow burn, the warmth taking its sweet time as it winds through your veins. The second sip is deeper, less sweet. It reminds you of malt and hay, of bitter herbs with medicinal origins. You can feel the tea soothe you, restoring you. Your third and last sip is a perfect amalgamation of tannic Earl Grey, thick cream and sweet sugar swirling on your tongue in harmony. As the taste of your last sip fades, time begins again. A slight breeze shifts the roses outside. On the mantel, the cat nudges the obscure tin, the tea that smelled like soil and chocolate. You squint. There is a label after all, Yerba Mate. Her job done, the cat hops back to the carpet, curling up in the sunbeams. She promptly drifts off. When you are ready, we will continue our journey once more. But please take your time to stop and smell the roses first. We are airborne once more. Friendly winds buoy us south, crossing France and Spain in a single breath. The moon shines brightly above us and stars twinkle their greetings as we pass. As we dip past the equator, we glide over Algeria, Chad, and Zimbabwe. The sweet night air hot and dry in our lungs. We are bound for a land of grasslands and savannas, of wise elephants and fierce lions of the beautiful coastline of Cape Town. We fly for South Africa, the home of rich rooibos tea. Your bed alights beside a watering hole in a grassy savanna. Leagues of windswept grass undulate like waves around you. The sun is high in the sky a soaring hawk eagle casting shadows across the plain as it searches for lunch. You are surrounded by yellow wood and marula trees, baobabs and sycamore figs. An elephant lounges near you, plucking the delicious fruit with his trunk. He winks a lethargic eye at you in welcome. This is the home of rooibos tea, 
The San people have harvested the red bush for thousands of years, believing that the plant's medicinal qualities would keep one in good spiritual and physical health. San men spent days roaming the region's peaks in search of the spiny needles distinctive to rooibos plants, donkeys in tow. In the village, San women ground the leaves into pulp, the tea sun-drying on flat granite and obsidian. After harvest, everyone drank steeped rooibos, including the village children. Today, rooibos tea is among the most popular varieties in the world, consumed by countries the world over. Filled with antioxidants, it is believed to bring its drinkers an inner sense of calm, alleviating stress and improving overall health. The elephant rolls in the mud, cooling down from the day's heat. He points near you with his trunk. There is a slab of obsidian beside you, dried rooibos pulp spread on its surface and a shallow granite bowl next to it. The rooibos smells earthy, rich vanilla notes wafting around you under the hot African sun. For the fifth time, take a deep breath and look inwards. The hawk eagle above you is suspended in flight, his wings broad and strong. The elephant lies still in cool mud, his eyes closed in pleasure. This moment is yours alone. When you are ready, your rooibos tea is ready. Your first sip is confident and luxurious, like caramelized sugar and dark chocolate. It's as if nostalgia has a taste. You are swept back to your childhood, those moments where you shared sweets with loved ones. Your second sip is more subtle, the sweetness shifting to something more natural, like grapes or the barest hint of pineapple. Your third sip drains the small granite cup and you taste cinnamon, nutmeg and cloves, the last numbing your tongue as you swallow. As the flavors fade, take a moment for yourself. You are welcome here. You can rest in this grassy savanna deep within South Africa for as long as you need. When you are ready, tuck yourself further into your comfortable bed. There are more lovely teas to drink, so we must be going. Our next stop remains in the Southern Hemisphere. As you fly in your bed, west across the wide expanse of the South Atlantic Ocean, know that we also travel back in time to an era long, long before today's shining Brazilian cities, before the Spanish conquistadors, even before the Incan Empire. As we glide over the spectacular eastern coastlines of Brazil, the stars shine bright above you, and the world is anew beneath you. We fly inland, following fresh river waters to our destination. Below you, vibrant rainforests teem with life. Sleek jaguars nap in tree branches, adorable armadillos trundle in cool muds and chattering otters lock paws as they float down streams, content. Though it is now early morning, the sun weak on your face, the air is 
is already heavy with heat. We have come to find the true discoverers of the tea called Yerba Mate. The early indigenous peoples who learned of the tea secrets harvested the plant for villages of loved ones and passed their secrets from generation to generation. We are here to find the Gurani people. It is said that the Gurani believed in the sacred and divine nature of flowing waters. If we are to believe the history books, villages were built in clusters around waterfalls and families would drink from the water every morning and evening, believing that the water's purity would bless everything it touched. Gurani culture taught its people that the essence of life lay in the tumbling cascades of fresh water, and the Gurani lived by that doctrine each and every day of their lives. It is at the foot of a beautiful waterfall that your comfortable bed comes to rest. Your view is nothing short of spectacular, and you are protected from the spray by a large yerba plant. It is lush and ready for harvest. Seeds are dark purple and leaves full with ripeness. Behind you, the Gurani have built a village that is meant to thrive within the humidity of a tropical rainforest. Family homes are shaped around monkey puzzle trees. Stone shrines are lovingly mounted at the foot of floss silk trees and the white sap of rubber trees is used to glue wall to wall, structure to structure, roof to roof. The Gurani surround you, going about their lives without casting you a glance. Children play in the waterfall spray, laughing. An elderly woman washes her face in the water, her eyes closed with contentment. A man picks lush leaves from the yerba plant, carrying a woven basket full of seeds and leaves on his hip. Later he will carefully lay the tea leaves next to a mangrove fire, drying them with the help of the flames. The seeds are bound for a thorough rinse in a hand-woven sieve and will be planted when the seasons allow. The Gurani people were the first to harvest yerba mate picking and drying its leaves to drink in cool teas. Their goddess wanted to make another god laugh, and so she transformed into the herb Yerba, or so the story goes. Her new form was so in tune with the earth that she refused to change back, blessing each and every Yerba mate plant with her divine essence. Flush with healing properties and hallowed secrets, the herb and brewing process both became sacred. Drinking the tea would make your heart pulse with life, stimulate your senses, and heal you overnight. Today, yerba mate tea is known as something of a panacea, its medicinal qualities promising to cure any number of ailments. The Gurani people believed that drinking their tea was a sacred experience, so much so that they kept the secrets of harvest to their families for generations, knowing that the goddess wanted her gift to remain among her people. Brewing the tea in flowing waterfalls was doubly sacred, a way to divine blessings from both the Yerba goddess and life itself. A child taps your arm. He is no older than four. Without a word, he offers you a hollowed gourd. His eyes are light with excitement. The gourd is full to the brim with prepared yerba mate tea, a gift from the Gurani people. Tucked into your cuddly bed, you accept this gift with pleasure and drink. For the sixth time, pause, breathe, and look inwards. 
Your tea is cool to the touch, chilled by the cascading water in the nearby falls. Spray, so refreshing mere moments ago, is suspended mid-air. This moment is yours. No one moves. It's as though time has stopped. When you are ready, take a sip, the first of three. At first, the tea is bitter on your tongue, like fresh raindrops on parched earth. If Petricor had a taste, you think it would be Yerba Mate. On your second sip, the liquid is almost oily, like rich butter. You can taste mint and lemon. On your third and last sip, your senses begin to soak up the sacred essence of the blessed yerba herb, and a gentle sweetness coats your mouth. You imagine the goddess, present in the whirls of the yerba branches, in the plant's new offshoots, in the way the seeds ripen to a rich purple. You have been blessed. When you are ready, we must thank the Garani people for their kindness and bid them goodbye. The orchid beside you, the beautiful flower from the Indian man in Darjeeling, will prove a wonderful gift. You give it to the child and smile your thanks. We have one more land to visit before you sleep, one more tea to sip before you dream. Burrow into your blankets and we will begin our ascent. From ancient South America, we must again travel across time and the earth. We aim for the present day gliding west over the entirety of the Pacific Ocean. Your bed will take you to a land of snow and firs, pine forests and domed churches, elegant ballets and fine literature. We aim for Russia. Imagine in your bed You hover above a beautiful stately building, its arched entrance framed by marble columns and ornate Grecian carvings. It is snowing, and atop the building's roof, a majestic statue of a charioted man is coated in sparkling white. This is the Bolshoi Theatre in Moscow, home of the world's largest ballet company. The theatre's curtains have been drawn, the crystal chandelier dimmed. We have arrived long past the last act, and so the theatre is empty but for a single ballet dancer, the understudy of the prima ballerina. Sitting cross-legged on the main stage, She massages her sore dancer's feet, tucking them into oversized fuzzy socks. She waits for you, the final curtain call, to enjoy one last cup of tea before her night slumber. Your snug bed comes to rest in the orchestra pit, settling on the maestro's podium, yawning The ballerina waves a friendly hello. You yawn too, nestling deeper under your covers. The theatre's darkness is calming. Rows upon rows of velvet seats empty. Its grand wars wrap around balconies hollow. Outside, snow continues to fall. It's as though the very building is asleep. 
the ballerina clasps a beautiful gilded glass, half full with hot water. You can see the steam rise from your bed. The chalice is traditional among the people of Russia, part of time-honoured customs and adorned with an elaborate design of cobalt blue. The ballerina raises an elegant finger to point at something on your left, and you see a matching gilded glass waiting for you on a nearby music stand. She taps an ornate metal urn beside her. It's circuitous design, a perfect match to your glasses. It is a samovar, a traditional silver tea urn that friends and family often use to brew hot tea for one another, a widely known symbol of great hospitality and comfort. The ballerina hums, her lilting tune echoing back at you from the theatre's domed eaves. Tea is extraordinarily popular in Russian culture. Here, the drink is a treat best enjoyed with loved ones, and so tea leaves undergo a rare two-step brewing process. First, a pinch of leaves is brewed in a shared samovar. As friends wait, they savour each other's company, warming their palms on their own half-full glass of hot water. When the samovar is ready, friends pass the urn, filling their cups to their heart's desire. Some might prefer their tea to be light and floral, so they would pour perhaps half a cup from the samovar, stirring in a teaspoon of lemon. Others might prefer their tea thick and syrupy, so they would pour two cups from the samovar, heaping more tea leaves and honey into their glass. No matter your taste, the Russians believe you are always welcome around the samovar. The ballerina lifts the samovar with care, pouring hot tea into her waiting glass. Often, Russians serve sweet apricot jams, lemon cake, and honey cookies alongside their tea. But you find you are still full from the Duchess's afternoon tea in Victorian England. A cup of tea with a friend will do. Traditionally, Russian tea is an aromatic blend of black and green teas from China. Smoky, sweet, and full-bodied. It is said that the smoky flavour originated from caravan campfires on the tea's long journey from China to Russia. Today, tea leaves are fermented to mimic the smoky flavour. Samovar in hand, the ballerina hops off the stage, her movements elegant. Without a word, she pours hot tea into your waiting glass, its deep colours clouding as it hits the water. You can smell wood smoke, malt and rich cocoa. When the tea coalesces into a lovely nut brown, you nod your thanks and the ballerina glides back to the hot tea that awaits her on the centre stage. You add a pinch of sugar, a dollop of honey, and a smidgen of lemon juice. You and the ballerina will take your first sips together. For the seventh and last time, pause, breathe, and look inward. The theatre around you is still and silent. The ballerina waiting for you to drink. There is nothing but you and your gilded tea glass. When you are ready, take a sip. This tea, a complex blend of black and green leaves, is layered your first sip takes a moment to pass out each taste. You sense smoke first, then cinnamon, then molasses and plums. 
the flavors complement one another like old friends. Your second sip is calmer, more peaceful, as the flavors unite. You feel drowsy, content. After all, you've come a long way. Your third and last sip of this journey coats your mouth in sweetness and you know you're ready to sleep. You smile at the ballerina and she smiles back, sipping her tea over the samovar. Neither of you say a word. And with that, dear listener, our voyage is complete. While we travelled far and wide to hear the delectable story of tea, know that the countries we visited are mere rest stops on the journey of the glorious tea leaf. Tea has travelled roads long lost, paths forgotten over time, the lush cliffs of Sri Lanka, the indigenous peoples of Australia, the deep snows of northern Canada, the damp marshes of the southern United States, the golden dawns of the Al Juran Empire. The list continues, perhaps never ending. But you have come far, and it is time to rest. As your wonderful bed returns you home, imagine all those you met entering their own dream worlds. The Chinese villagers in the Shang Dynasty, the Japanese woman who prepared the way of tea, the Indian man who gifted you both Darjeeling and an orchid, the Duchess's purring Persian cat in Victorian England, the wise elephant at the watering hole in South Africa, the Gurani people beside their sacred waterfalls, and the Russian ballerina on the main stage of the Bolshoi Theatre. As you sleep, so do they, tucked into their own warm, cosy beds. On this note, our story ends. Good night and sweet dreams. <laughs>